and here we go. So hi everyone, welcome to the Frictionless Data Monthly Community Call. Uh, so this today, today uh, we're going to hear from uh, Anne Lee Steele, um, and she's going to tell us a bit about uh, open science best practices at the Turing Way. Uh, some of you may remember Anne because she's one of our Frictionless Fellows. Um, she was part of the second cohort. Uh, I propose that we just start with a round of introductions. Uh, I can maybe start. I'm Sara Petti. I'm the Community Manager for Frictionless Data. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to here and today. I'm based in Bologna, Italy, uh, and I'll just pick someone else to go next. Uh, maybe Jen? Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm really interested to hear what you're going to say, Anne, about the Turing way today. And that's why I've joined. And I used, used to use Frictionless as part of my job as a data manager. And I pick Sashi. Sassi and I recently joined Open Knowledge Foundation as a developer and I'm really happy to be part of the uh, community uh, program because this is my first program and I would like to choose uh, Jonathan. Hey, I'm Jonathan Mitchell. I work for a company called Inovi Health. I'm a software developer and I'm just interested in the frictionless effort and I'm happy to kind of get more knowledge by just showing up to these things. So I love it. Um, let's toss it over to Edgar. Hi, everyone. I'm Edgar. I work as a developer in Open Knowledge and contribute to frictionless projects also. And I'm based in Italy, Rapallo, in the sea. And I choose Ponsalet. Thank you very much. I'm Ponsalet. I'm a computer scientist I'm based in the Gambia. I run an innovative hub called Yoko Labs Angel. We, we were a pan African network of hubs around Africa, and I look forward to It's my first time and in a lot of collaboration. Thank you. I pick. Philip, Phil. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Phil Schum. I'm at the University of Chicago. I'm a statistician, fairly new to frictionless myself too, uh, but involved in building a number of data sharing platforms for NIH and keen to learn about how we might uh, incorporate frictionless into those efforts. Oh, sorry. Uh, I pick, oh, this is going to be tough. Uh, uh, Joanna. You're muted. Yeah, sorry, oh, yeah. long way to the unmute button. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Joanna, and I'm um, business dev and marketing lead at Datopian. Um, probably some of you have heard of the company. We are very uh, involved in open data and our president Rufus Pollock is basically uh, the creator of uh, SICAN and Frictionless and uh, Data Hub and many other open data projects. Um, yeah, I'm here because I'm generally interested in open data and specifically in uh, open um, science. Um, and yeah, I'm glad to be here. Would you like to pick someone else, Joanna, to go next? Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, so let's go with uh, Jonathan. I think you haven't yet introduced yourself. Yeah. I did, but I'll toss it over to Francisco. Uh, hi, I'm Francisco. I'm from Brazil. Uh, I'm responsible for running the state of Minas Gerais uh, open data portal, and we are heavily using friction as, as kind of a foundational layer in the, in the stack for the portal. Thanks, Francisco. Do you, would you like to pick someone else to go next? Sorry. Uh, uh, Keith? Hello, um, Keith. Uh, I work at NIH and I'm currently based in California. Uh, I was really hoping when I checked the agenda this morning, it would be something really 
uninteresting or not adjacent to what I do and I could skip and go back to sleep, but uh, it looks too good. So here I am. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to this talk and Phil, we should talk later. I'd be curious to hear what you're up to and what you're working on. Absolutely. And okay, uh, has Ola gone? I'm not sure. No. Hi, hi everyone. Sorry, I had to uh, jump from another one meeting to another today. I'm uh, Oleg from uh, Switzerland, uh, from Bern, um, open data activist, member of the Swiss chapter of Open Knowledge, and maintainer of uh, Once Upon a Time of Ju the Julia Libraries for Frictionless Data. Um, more recently, uh, helping uh, Anne and team to uh, with their exciting project, and very very happy to be here. Um, and um, I'll pick you up. Have you? I don't know if you've gone already, but you're next to me on the list. So, Joanna's already gone, but I think we're missing Carlos and Mike still. So, uh, right, Carlos, go ahead, you... Carlos, the ball is yours. You just got to use sign language. Maybe now. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm Carlos. I'm a software engineer. I used to use Frictionless quite a lot in my previous job, and now not that much, or not at the moment. But I wanted to know what's new and see some known faces, and I'm looking forward to the talk. And I think the next one, it, I thought it was Mike or Jonas I had. I guess I'll, I'll so Mike, if you yeah. haven't done sure it yet, that. remember. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Mike Trisna. I uh, work at the Smithsonian uh, Institution in DC as a, um, a data scientist. And this is my first uh, community meeting. Um, still haven't put any frictionless data into practice. And I'm looking for some use cases to hopefully uh, get our data into nice uh, schemas. Um, and then was there anyone else on the uh, it's uh, this nick is like, i think nick okay hi everyone nick kellett uh, founder and ceo of deploy solutions in canada um we've been researching ways that uh, software solutions can help with climate change and we build geospatial applications and we started using frictionless only a few months ago we're using it very heavily for both of those things uh so we're learning as much as we can about it as quickly as we can um for a variety of reasons which i i think i'll have the opportunity to talk to you about uh, at one of these calls. So I joined to say hello. I've got a client call in a few minutes, but um, it uh, it's a wonderful tool set and it looks like a really good community. So really happy to uh, have a chance to meet you all. And I'm not sure if anyone's left. Uh, is there anybody I should be picking who hasn't uh, gone yet? I think we did the tour. Um, so thanks everyone. I'll just hand it to you, Anne. Um, maybe let me just Yes, now you, got, you can also share your screen if you, if you need to. Um, I guess before sharing my screen, I'll just introduce myself real quick. Uh, it was really interesting to hear, uh, one, the geographical distribution of everyone here, but also like the, the variety of expertise in this space. And hopefully uh, by the end of this call, we'll be able to have maybe a bit more conversations about how maybe something like that could be um, kind of brought into the Turing way or how we can support also you work at, at Frictionless. So um, really quickly about me, uh, I am the new community manager for Turing Way, uh, which is a project that's kind of based or associated with the Alan Turing Institute, which is the National Institute for Data Science and, and AI in the UK. But the Turing Way occupies this kind of funny space where it was incubated as a project of a researcher named Kirsty Whitaker a couple of years ago. Um, because of some like grant money that came in, you know, kind of those processes work. Uh, but it actually started as a kind of coalition of different researchers going, we really support open science practices. We want to maybe create something um, that, you know, other researchers can contribute to, but also as openness in practice. Um, let's, let's do it. And so from that, very organically, uh, came this uh, first book that I'll show you in a second called The Book of Reproducible Research. Um, but in the time since then, and that was around, I believe, 2019, uh, the book has really expanded into now five different guides um, and all have to do in some way with 
with uh, open science, but it's actually expanded much more largely into open research. And so uh, before I get started, I'll say really quickly, one, I'm an anthropologist by training. Like I'm not, uh, I have a background in data journalism, um, but I'm definitely more so about like supporting the, the people behind these processes. And I think that's, um, and with that being said, it's kind of more about kind of connecting to the expertise in different spaces in order to go, how can we create best practices and, and how can we kind of share between these different parts of the open ecosystem, open data being sometimes uh, quite connected to, to open source software, for example, or, or open research, but sometimes those connections are quite clear. Um, yeah, and so I will share my screen to show you all a little bit about the book here. And feel free, uh, I didn't really prepare any slides because I thought it would be quite informal. We can just have a chat. Honestly, stop me at any time, uh, ask any questions, uh, tell me if anything isn't clear. Uh, and yeah, and I'll be happy to answer them as I go. So uh, this is the train way. Um, so it's uh, kind of, as I had said before, um, it's very much a constant. The thing that I kind of emphasized every single time I, I've talked about it, um, is that it's very much this kind of work in progress. Uh, everything is changing and being contributed to in real time. Um, and so we started with this kind of guide for reproducible research um, in a couple of different uh, chapters here. We have like the, the whole book is built on Binder Hub. We have someone um, within Binder who contributes directly to um, the Turing Way. And so she was able to write a chapter on this. As I was thinking about frictionless, I realized, you know, that would be something that I feel like a lot of different re researchers in a lot of different arenas could could learn more about. Um, so if anyone is interested in maybe uh, bringing some of that documentation over on frictionless tools into something like the tree way, um, that would be incredible. Um, but as I said so before, it's kind of expanded into uh, many other areas of what it means to be an open researcher. And so that means, you know, creating uh, guides for project design, you know, how do you start a project that has kind of open research or open science principles at its core, um, from, you know, creating repositories on GitHub to collaborative working practices, um, to even uh, using open, uh, we actually have a chapter in, in process about using Wikipedia for, for research communication or science communication. And even though that may not necessarily seem like open science from like, first impression it actually is right it's a, it's a part of that ecosystem of how do we do our work open and collaboratively inclusively reproducibly but also how can we kind of how can we do that for not only the production of data research also into the communication of it at the end of the day too um yeah and so like i was saying before we have this kind of third guide that's emerged over time especially during i believe the 2020 2021 period um a guide for collaboration, collaborative working practices, guide for ethical research. It's a really, really massive book. It's like, I think something like 240 plus pages at this point. Um, and then we have a community handbook, which is kind of meta practices for the community itself. Um, but yeah, essentially our, our workflow is that we have a kind of Slack community, um, but then uh, everything, this whole book uh, written in Jupyter Book is actually done on GitHub collaboratively. And so I can show you a bit of that process if you're interested in, but um, yeah, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Just thought I'd give you a little tour of the project. Yeah, I have a question, if I may. Um, we're looking into citizen science a lot. And so one of the challenges is explaining to um, sort of lay people how to, how to communicate with scientists and how to have scientists communicate with them, how to share knowledge. Is, is that covered in here? Or is, is there a possibility of that kind of um, uh, tips and so on and tricks for citizen scientists? Oh, definitely. Um, I'd say I can, I can send you over a couple of links, but... Uh... I think there's a lot in reproducible research that we can bring in. Um, also, maybe some of that's on project design that I'll that I'll send your way. Um, but it, it's funny because actually a couple of things have come up that I wanted to flag for you all in the community here is that one uh, with the different kind of people. It's it's a book that's been created by 300 researchers over the course of I think four 
four years at this point, um, three years. Uh, and it's interesting because it means that you have people that have, you know, authorship within this collaborative project, you know, getting past the, the notion of single author papers um, to, you know, something that's being built on in real time. But uh, something that's missing, funnily enough, is these very kind of entry level points. It's very easy to get quite quickly into like, you know, how do we do things reproducibly with a single tool as opposed to, you know, I want to get into the the shallow end of what citizen science looks like. And so I think finding that balance between what is a good introductory tool um, to, to introduce people to open science uh, principles, as opposed to like the nitty gritty of like, how can we use frictionless data in order to make our research more reproducible? Finding that balance is really hard. And that, that's actually something that hopefully I'm gonna be doing more of this year. So we can maybe structure the book in a way that, that makes sense for everyone. Um, but yeah, I, I saw that there was another question. I'm sorry that, a little ramble there. I think Ponselet had a question, maybe. Yes, um, I, I just wanted to, to know in terms of um, overall, can we use it as a tool to collect um, data for public good? That's using the um, Turing model for. Um, this is like which, uh, basically the data for public good and talking of is data stored in government archives that usually the public will need to research. And can we use it in that format? It's interesting you say that because I wonder if, if uh, actually I would say that that's. Um, there's a, another community, funnily enough, called Write the Docs, uh, which is all about the importance of documentation, um, which I can send over to you as well. But I'd say that uh, for, for the Turing Way, the, the resource that I think I would recommend looking at is maybe the Guide for Collaboration or the Guide for Communication, um, because both of those talk much more about like, what does it mean to you know, make sure that we're documenting best practices. Um, and we're actually ourselves, um, there's a small kind of team of community managers that has emerged at the Turing, where we're trying to, you know, we have a couple of different projects, some are related to healthcare, some are related to um, some big like science funding that's happening in the UK right now. And we're realizing that, that the projects are very different. Um, we're trying to develop meta practices that can be adopted for other communities as well, so that it's not like, you know, creating a a bespoke model for the Turing way, but rather that it can be applied to, to other projects, especially when it comes to something so important as documentation. So um, I'm happy to send over more of those uh, specific links that come to mind too. Uh, Keith, I think has a question. Hey. Uh, first off, this is really fantastic. So uh, great work. And uh, it's awesome that you have so many people working on it together. I think that's going to have a really great effect. Um, it seems like this is mainly focused at the individual kind of researchers uh, as a guide kind of from their perspective. Have you considered including sections targeting uh, other parties? So in particular, what I'm thinking of is one of the big, I think, kind of hurdles to improving the state of reproducible research is changing uh, things from the end of the journals. Um, so right now, the bar for submitting research, even bioinformatics or you know computational research that is intended to be reproducible, uh, the bar is very low. Like you can pretty much publish. Uh, something that's not reproducible at all and get it into a prestigious journal. And until that changes, it's hard to see the field really uh, moving forward very much. So uh, yeah, I was just wondering, have you considered like trying to tackle these other kind of bigger systemic issues that might not be something the individual would talk about or tackle, but that could be worth at least being aware of and you know discussing? That is a, a great question. Um, I think that, you know, uh, I'd say the, the goal for this project more broadly has kind of two, two sort of structural aims. One is the, the aim to kind of 
dismantle or at least challenge uh, single author authorship on, on papers and to focus on like what collaborative work looks like out in the open. But the, the second thing, which kind of tag, uh, ties to what you were saying about the difficulty of reproducibility is really to uh, make reproducible research so easy that it can't, like it, it's the best option to be done. Um, and so oftentimes the barriers that you all are much more familiar with would be the you know the process of kind of setting your foundation in a project it's, it's often takes a lot more legwork up front but ultimately creates you know something that can actually be reproduced later on and actually saves you a lot of time in the long run and that is such a cultural shift for a lot of people um, because of the upfront work required um, and especially with pressures of like funding and you know, the dynamics of labs etc and so absolutely, to answer your question, we would love to have more of that kind of work tackling this. And I will say it's, to a certain extent, a little bit of an issue with organization of the book, because we actually just two weeks ago had an article or a, a subchapter that was re released on peer review that touched some of these publishing issues. Um, but I don't think it's quite as easy to find slash like a, a big kind of structural sort of issue that we're dealing with at the moment or, or trying to think more about is how do we reach audiences that aren't kind of already converted into open ways of doing things? Because it's a kind of lightly opinionated guide, meaning it's a combination of different voices and different ways of thinking about open research, but it's, um, it's not structured in a way that may be as friendly for like industry actors or like uh, different uh, disciplines that maybe don't have openness or aren't as kind of open to openness or open to open practices, so to speak. And so that's something that we're also trying to to think about moving forward because there's so much stuff in there. But it's like, you know, is it is, is it actually tackling tackling those like fundamental problems and those like entry level issues that um, someone had asked earlier? Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Thanks. Just one more kind of unrelated uh, idea, and this is just to like seed the idea for some future thought. And it's something I've been thinking about recently that doesn't seem to get a lot of discussion in the context of reproducible research, uh, but that's uh, making or producing articles and analyses that are atomic. So in kind of software engineering, you typically try to make your code kind of modular and atomic and not have functions that are doing 20 things, but just do one thing and do it well. That doesn't really seem to be the case in science. Instead, we kind of go the other direction. You just cram as much as you can in a single paper. And then the chance that at least part of it's going to be wrong increases, you know, the more you add into it. And it kind of makes it both, it also raises the bar to even publishing in the first place. Because if your goal is you know, some high impact journal with 50 experiments and all these kind of analysis, then it's going to take a long time to get it out there. It's going to be really in hard for the community to interpret it or take a lot of time and energy to parse it and make sense of it. Um, and then, you know, parts of it are going to be wrong. Whereas if we kind of started to reframe things and think more about what is like, you know, smaller chunks of uh, the question that I can, you know, tackle and try to produce in a much shorter paper, then you end up with this kind of more modular landscape of things that could be cited and refuted or, you know, advanced. Uh, again, this is just a side thought and something to consider for the future. Keith, I'm going to send you a PR. Actually, we had that exact phrase, make it atomic, used by someone in the community a couple of weeks ago for kind of a chapter that we're trying to restructure or build, especially around um, sensitive data. Uh, I'll send that your way because uh, Sounds like Great, I would love that. Uh, Mike, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, um, I wanted to know if you could uh, tell tell us more about the illustrations. I think that's like it definitely pops out at me as it being something that sets uh, this documentation apart. I'm thinking of like what I would have otherwise some kind of terrible like PowerPoint diagram, um, and. You know, I, I always thought that Scriberia was like a, um, I, I saw that like the signature on all of them. I thought it was like a Banksy type uh, pseudonym and I just Googled it and it's like a company. I was just wondering um, how that collaboration works. So Scriberia, that's so funny you say that because 
I feel like a lot of people are actually exposed to the Turing way by virtue of those illustrations that they've seen in another presentation or in some other project because they're creative, they, they're licensed open, so you can use them as you wish with credit. Um, and they're a group that's kind of worked with the Turing way for a long time. So uh, one kind of key way where contributions happen um, is through this event called a book dash where uh, it's kind of a condensed period, think like hackathon um, sort of thing or a mapathon sort of thing, um, where it's a kind of structured set of time where people you know, have a project in mind or, or a chapter that they want to write. And um, we do it together uh, in a structured sort of program, programmatic, programmatic way over the course of three or four days. And we actually have one coming up at the end of May. Um, but throughout that period, we're working with Scriberia, this kind of company, illustration company that um, helps us to translate kind of key key parts of, of these contributions into something a lot more visual. And funnily enough, it's probably the thing that's had most reach. And kind of going back to that first question that was asked about, you know, how do we introduce something like um, like uh, citizen science to people? Is through oftentimes much more easily kind of digested through something like an illustration um, than, you know, a page of text uh, describing that process. So yeah, it's something that we found to be really, really helpful and really useful in kind of getting the word out. But also if you want to use it at any point for any project that you're working on, please, please feel free. Um, it's all openly licensed. Ole. Hey, Jan. <clears throat> I would just, uh, I love your effort, everything about it. And I would just uh, love to see Evgeny present live mark and frictionless data at a fireside chat. So when can we make that happen? That's actually a question that I've had um, for you all, was that one thing that we've been kind of, crit crit I don't want to say critiqued for, but one thing that's come up many times, especially in conversations with people in, um, within kind of the open science, open source universe, there are two things. One is that a lot of researchers get into the world of open source through the Python or R communities, um, but they don't get involved in contributing the projects upstream. They're mostly involved in kind of the application of these languages or these tools. Um, and so it's a something that we're trying to develop is one, like maybe a chapter more focused on open infrastructure and what that looks like. And I think frictionless really fits within that framework um, because it's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into, I'm thinking of like the Jupyter book, which we use to build the entire um, Turing Way project on like uh, anything that affects the Jupyter book code base is kind of leaked into all of the different projects that use Jupyter book. And similarly, like frictionless is a project that gets used across all of these different spaces at the government level, at the company level. Um, I've definitely, I remember throughout my fellowship was kind of amazed at the amount of times frictionless came up um, in the projects that I was working on. And so, yeah, I think that that's a kind of a goal is to empower, find ways of empowering researchers to get involved in infrastructure upstream. And so I think that that would be an amazing idea for a future fireside chat if everyone wants to get involved um, to speak. Uh, I think it's a really important topic. Yeah, that would be awesome, I think. Do we have other questions? Yes, Francisco. Hi, so, so here in, in Major Eyes, we are in the pro, I am in the central unit responsible for the open data portal. And we are in the process of trying to, we might say evangelize the departments that are actually responsible for publishing open data to follow some principles. And that, that part of the work like is really hard. And I was hoping to hear a little bit more uh, of what you guys are trying to do to like convince researchers to actually follow the practices. Uh, like, is there some active, uh, active, uh, you mentioned something about like trying to reach people that are not already uh, following open science best practices, but instead of just publishing, what are you doing for like getting these people to do things differently? 
Yeah, that's also a really great question um, because funnily enough, uh, something that we've seen a lot is that while the Turing Way is kind of, I think by association, quite tied to the Turing, Alan Turing Institute, honestly, there's not a lot of practices that are used within certain research teams within the Alan Turing Institute, especially those that are tied to like um, uh, health data, for example, is a really, really difficult one when we're talking about anything related to openness. And so uh, it's one, it feels like, it's asking for a huge culture shift, uh, working out in the open. 10 years after uh, the 10, is it 10, 15? I don't know how long OKF has been around, but after that kind of initial push towards openness, it's a very uneven landscape where you have you know, some fields that have really like tried to op adopt the open science model and others that are kind of exposed to it that are more or less like kind of interested, but maybe want to pick and choose different tools. And then you have like complete resistance in certain arenas. And the way that we usually are trying to, to pitch it or at least talk about it is that one, there's meant to be like an efficiency element and that working openly can actually make your project more uh, efficient to run because it means that you know there's accountability, there's a lot of legwork that you can do um, from the onset of a project, especially when it comes to, to research. But uh, two, it's kind of, uh, and this is coming from, my own experience, the way that I think about why the Turing Way is so important um, is that we're kind of operating in a time where public trust is at an all time low and open practices or open way of working can do a lot to at least mitigate or begin to mitigate um, that sense of public distrust that's kind of rampant in all of our institutions. And if you're one to kind of set that example and to begin to put those processes in place, I think that there's a lot of pushback because people are scared of what it means to be, and organizations are scared of what it means to be like vulnerably open because being open means open to criticism and open to being trolled or something. And that's honestly not, that's not necessarily the case. We've seen it time and time again. Um, yeah, and so that that's the way that I, at least I think about it. And the more that I talk about public trust, the more that it seems to track in, in spaces where um, openness is maybe not the status quo. I don't know if that would imply in your organization. Yeah, no, I think it is. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Okay, I'm guessing no. Anne Lee, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I did actually have the question for you all here, which is that um, in your experience, you know, working with frictionless tools or being interested in working with frictionless tools, what barriers have you experienced in, you know, trying to adopt them within your own institutions um, with trying to get people involved in the project itself? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll start with those two. For me, um, Anne, is the tools, you know, in getting people involved in my organization is, you know, getting them into, um, to work at understanding um, that we have to use open source tools and stuff like that. And sometimes it's a hard process, you know, although I try to tell them that, oh, let's make use of principles of the International Open Data Charter as, as a guide. You know, but it would be good um, to know that uh, if you have um, young interns and young um, professionals just joining the organization, um, um, what tools would you advise them to use in terms of uh, data assistant so that one of frictionalized data get I like. You broke a little bit, Ponsoletto, on the last question, I think. I didn't hear that completely, but maybe it was just me. I said I would like to get, like, um, uh, input on the, like, 
in terms of frictionalized data, in terms of two, what um, 101, is it lecture or, or breakdown of um, a step that we say you want to introduce people into uh, tools that help you frictionalize, like a 101 guideline? If I put I don't know what I'm well, if I'm in, if I'm interpreting your question correctly, I'm gonna send this link here. Um, is that the number one thing actually that we found to be uh, really useful for for researchers at least is just learning how to work with GitHub. Uh, a friend on my team, she uh, has a PhD in physics and never used GitHub during the entirety of her degree, let alone had really um, programmed anything. And so she said it was like this brain kind of opening moment where she realized oh you know this is what collaboration looks like in practice um yeah and it's a, as simple as like understanding the github workflow and realizing that like something that you're making um you know i think a lot of a lot of people are used to kind of or i i definitely have certain repositories they're like projects that i'm working on very much used to kind of like pushing out all of my code somewhere into a repository at github uh not really working on documentation, like realizing that it's just kind of, you know, something that I'm working on, but working in a collaborative project through which actually the Turing way is kind of a gateway in a different way um, to being able to create these collaborative workflows on, on GitHub means that, you know, you can't just push your own code. Uh, your PR has to have, you know, documentation within it. It's a whole different way of working than like uploading to your own repository on your own account. Um, and that was kind of, yeah, a, a big shift, I think, for a lot of people that we've interacted with was simply getting started on GitHub was really huge. Um, but also, funnily enough, something that I've been kind of flagging or trying to understand is this kind of culture gap between like wiki-based communities and, and uh, GitHub-based communities, because in different academic uh, open research uh, disciplines, they might be used to one or the other, and both of them are collaborative workflows, but like, you know, peer review is perhaps most closely related to the GitHub workflow, but what does that actually look like on like a wiki tool um, that other communities use? So yeah, just a little bit of an interesting topic, but it feels like you almost have to pick and choose which, uh, which entry point is the best for your discipline. Thank you. I think I got clarity on that because in terms of, I was looking at it more when you explained about the peer review side because my, mostly they prefer the, the wiki side of things and I'm telling them this, you know, you use GitHub, it gives you better collaboration, better to understand whether you're in the right process or not. So thank you. Open Phytocytes, actually, another open research group. They run introductions to GitHub instead of the Carpentries, I believe. I can send some of that information over to you because uh, there are lots of maybe like entry level sort of uh, workshops that students can get involved in. Um, Francesco, do you want to go? Yeah, so just maybe sharing some of the difficulties that we are facing here in, in Indonesia Rice. Uh, like from the get-go, we, because we act as a central unit to convince other departments to publish open data, but we also are responsible for publishing some specific kinds of, of open data related to public financial management. So we have like experience in both ends. And for us, when we are publishing data, uh, we were sure that we wanted an, an automated process to publish. So that meant a lot more uh, technical uh, skills from the part of the publishers, my team, uh, to be able to make that sustainable. Like there is this upfront cost, but after that, like it, it, the, 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 the data pipelines are running. Uh, but when we are trying to spread that to the other departments, uh, the, the majority response is like, that's more work. Like I can't take any more work. Like I can't do, uh, I can't learn. So even if we, we uh, take out things like version control and, and collaboration on GitHub, like just documentation without any tools, like I can't do more uh, on top of what I'm already doing. So like uh, 
that that's why I was just asking what are you trying to do to to convince because it's it's been a problem to to kind of make this this bit of success you might say that that like it's easy it's easy to do the right thing like right now it's not easy to do the right thing you need to really believe it and put the time so I think that's the the major thing for us. Totally, and I think that this is actually probably touching upon like the uh, something that we've at least in uh, I've been involved in a couple of different projects in the within the open ecosystem, and often the question is like, are we actually reaching people outside of people that are already convinced of open ways of working, like I was saying before? And so, um, at least what we've we've used uh, is that it does actually end up being more efficient in future iterations of the project or like any revisions are actually much easier if that kind of initial legwork is done. Unfortunately, if I were to be honest, I feel like the way in which programs are structured, both in research and in industry, uh, means that it's almost kind of like, you know, quick and dirty, you try to get everything done as soon as possible so you can get it out without necessarily that like foundational legwork and it's almost like trying to rearrange the priorities of the entire system to prioritize building the foundation before even uh you know thinking about the end result and i don't think funding cycles really are supporting that as much or in, in research but also within industry as well the the kind of incentives necessarily aren't aren't there and so i wonder a couple of things if there's a way of like arranging incentives in such a way that one is incentivized within your organization to be able to have those documentation practices and if there are concrete examples of like if documentation is done well um, and you need to revise the project later that actually cuts down on a lot of time and pain and agony um, because i think that's ultimately at least in the research setting we've really seen like that push for reproducibility to make for example peer review so much less painful because you have you know, it's much easier to check someone's work, much easier to, to incorporate um, uh, comments, like all of these sorts of things are easier if you've built the foundation to actually reproduce your results, and let other people reproduce your results. Um, and if that ever happens to a person within research, they're immediately like, oh, I understand why now, even though I found it really annoying when I first got started. And so, yeah, I don't know if that would apply in the industry setting, but I wonder if there's something to take from that. Uh, I, I think that is uh, the, the problem is like when when people don't have that experience, that first hand experience of, of like feeling the pain, like uh, words are just words and it's hard to put that in the experience in the first place if they are not like doing things. But it, it's a good incentives are always good to think about. Yeah, and actually, uh, I'll kind of add to that quickly is that. Um, there's a lot of like intrinsic motivation to do do good work in the open space, but not a lot of like a extrinsic motivation. Um, and that's where extrinsic motivation meaning like, you know, uh, things that are coming from your organization, like reward structures, et cetera, et cetera. And so a question that I think a lot of that I'm definitely trying to, to think about as we go through the Turing way or, or at least talking about open practices more generally or reproducible research is what is that how can you quote unquote you know gamify uh something like open practices how can you make it so easy or how can you incentivize people in a way that yeah doesn't require like full conversion into open ways of working which sounds quite harsh and actually like a almost like a um almost like something that's going against the, the values of, of openness in a way where you're not fully converted to open ways of working, but you're like incentivized in a way that's quite, uh, yeah, it, I'm not sure if I'm making sense here, but it seems like there's this, there's a big gap that we're also trying to understand because if we can't get over that kind of hump, how is it going to have wider adoption and not be kind of pushing against the existing structure, which was built in a way that it is in part because you know, incentives are structured the way that they are because uh, it's much easier currently um, to keep it as the status quo. And so it's a, yeah, it kind of gets into the core of like what, it, why people are doing open science in the first place when, 
yeah, when like recognizing that people will do a lot for a sticker, for example, is like kind of a harsh and funny opposite side of that spectrum, if that makes sense. If I can jump in here, um, just Olet said something about giving them a better social network. And I think that there's some actually some application there. If you had research that was published and then uh, there was this network of peer review where others that could reproduce your research could say, yeah, I've, I've reproduced it. I've reproduced it. And it's almost like likes or, or views uh, uh, on that research that you could then have that community, uh, um, I guess, confidence saying that this has been reproduced by so many other institutes, including NIH or, or whoever else is there. And then you almost get these badges and social proof and all that. So that, that sounds like not a bad idea. I maybe have a question for you, Anne, as well. Um, since you were talking about incentives, I wonder if like at the Turing way you have like good examples of a system of incentives that really works somewhere in some institutions and if you could share that with us. Maybe, could you clarify what you mean on incentives? Incentives for what? Incentives for open ways of working or? For making research open and reproducible. Like institution that make it really institutionalized. Yeah, I think it's the it's all about that incentive structure. Like at the well, that combination actually of incentives and community, tying back to what Oleg was saying, because um, a lot of what we've been trying to to do, and I'm not directly involved in it, but I'm kind of involved in the planning process, are these um, kind of events with PhD students uh, to be able to talk more about the the Turing way or, you know, contribute to, to the guide. That process of, you know, actually contributing to something that they're now co-authors on or contributors to, that immediately forms a direct line to, oh, I'm a part of the Open Science Project. I feel like I'm a part of this community that's contributing to it. Um, but it often feels like a quite parallel universe to, um, like what they have to do according to their like their funders or their institutions. And so funnily enough, um, we found that it's through these kind of events where people are working collaboratively, forming community between each other, becomes that like gateway into, I'm really passionate about this project and I'm going to bring it back to my institution. And so a great example that we actually have is that while the Turing Way kind of was incubated at the Turing Institute, we have a lot of active researchers um, within the Netherlands. And one, um, one researcher who's like a core contributor to the project, um, she was so kind of converted into open ways of working into open science through being involved in the Turing Way that she advocated for a new role at her institution um, that like enabled her to one, get funding to contribute to the project, but also be a data steward within her institution because she was like, this is something that should be applied within our within our space. And so it was amazing to see how like one person kind of setting the standard for everything for her like, yeah, for her larger institution because she herself was converted into open ways of working. And so we slowly started seeing that like hub and spoke model happening in different spaces because um, yeah, but that's not to say that it doesn't take a huge amount of work, but it's definitely, you know, one person can have a massive effect on um, an entire organization if they uh, see space to do it. And that's where actually the notion of like research infrastructure roles is becoming increasingly more important because it gives a concrete title to, you know, an association or a bunch of different responsibilities that have been around for ages, but don't necessarily get institutional recognition. One uh, obvious example that comes to mind is research software engineers which have existed for as long as computers have been around, it's kind of like the people building digital infrastructure for research institutions. Um, it's really kind of caught on in the UK. I'll send you a quick history of the RSE role. Um, and it's 
meant that by virtue of being institutionalized as an actual job, uh, it's meant that there's been more support for that type and way of working within uh, universities across the UK. And so that would I, I would say would be the, the biggest example was that there are now, uh, now that there has been that sort of institutionalization of these roles specifically, that's meant that there's been support for being involved in the projects that, that build the tools. And so I wonder where something like a contributor to frictionless would be within this kind of these different uh, research infrastructure role ideas. I'll send that, we have actually a quick chapter description what I mean, what I mean by research infrastructure roles, but it's essentially like everyone that enables research to happen. Um, from like developing the software to, you know, ensuring that data flows between different spaces. It's, yeah, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thanks. Um, we might have time for a last quick question in case anyone has one. Come forward now or never. Okay, if there's nothing else, maybe I'll just go ahead and make some announcements. Um, so first of all, I wanted to tell you all that the next community call is going to be on the 26th of May, and we will be hearing about deploy solutions uh, from Nick Kellett, who was here until like 20 minutes ago, maybe. Um, that's going to be very interesting, I think, and they are using frictionless data, of course. The other thing that I wanted to announce is that tomorrow there's the Turing Ways fireside chat. So Anne is going to be there and Lily as well. Uh, and they're going to be speaking about how to make uh, conferences inclusive now that we're going back to the normal and to on-site conferences. I don't know if, Anne, you want to add anything about that? Um, yeah, we'd be happy to, to see you all there. I'll send the Eventbrite link in the chat here. Um, it's just a, a kind of fireside chat is really informal. They're just meant to be, we have six uh, different people, one actually from the frictionless team. Lily will be chatting um, with us on the panel. Um, it, yeah, it's meant, really just meant to, to talk about, you know, the different formats, like the hybrid format, the in-person format, the online format, trying to understand, you know, what are the trade-offs in each of these different ways of organizing events? Um, and yeah, what, what the kind of future of these events look like, especially given the sort of push to go back to in-person. And I also wanted to add something really quick is that um, if you're interested in getting involved with the book in any way, um, please, please uh, let me know. Um, maybe I can join the, the frictionless uh, Slack channel to maybe post some things in case people are interested in certain things. But um, yeah, please feel free to reach out at any point. Uh, I feel like there's a lot that we can add or at least maybe introduce researchers to frictionless, the, the frictionless um, way of working that I remember was really impactful for me as someone that was working with data in the journalism setting. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I should use these tools. I need to use them. But maybe something like the train weight could also be a big uh, a space to kind of amplify the toolkit. Um, that's what I thought. I would love to have your expertise in our space as well. Yes, and as Anne mentioned, the other thing that I wanted to also bring up is that our community, most of you already know, moved from Discord to Slack. I put the link in the chat here. It's also on the agenda doc. Uh, so if you haven't yet, please join us there. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to say, uh, unless any one of you wants to say anything. Okay, well, if not, and thanks again a lot for this presentation and for this discussion today. It was really, really great. And I hope that we can keep on going um, about it on the Slack. Um, one thing that I maybe also wanted to ask you is if you could maybe, I'll, I'll, I'll paste the links that are here in the chat, but if someone else comes to your mind, maybe just put it on the agenda doc so that you can share it with everybody after. Um, thank you all for joining today. It was great to see you and I'll see you again next month, I guess. Bye all, have a good rest of the day. Yeah, bye. Bye. bye bye. Thank you all so Thank much. You. Bye. bye.